there's also that question of how do you distribute it? Or as I like to say, how do you mobilize it, right? Because for me, it's not about distribution in a specifically the idea of media, right? I think a media has a very clear idea of distribution, which means you get bought and then you get put on some sort of platform and then you get streamed or you get some sort of buy-in from people to watch it and get you your money back and you have a theatrical release. And I don't think it's distribution as much as it's called, as much as the idea of it should be mobilization because you're not just distributing a story, you're mobilizing technology, right? Whether you're mobilizing a headset, whether you're mobilizing an augmented reality platform, the idea of what we're trying to do is we're trying to bring the story into different spaces. And it's a different, I think it's a different model than distribution. And when you spoke a little bit about theatrical distribution, right? How you can bring things to different stages and you really bring things to communities because then you have these stages set in different communities. Um, and I think the reality is that's closer to what we're doing, I think, in this emerging technology field than maybe what a traditional film is, where you can send a link to anybody who has any sort of computer and they stream it on their computer. Because for me, at least, when we're distributing or mobilizing a project, we're also thinking about the context that project's being seen in, which you've already spoke about too, right? If I just send a headset to somebody and I have them go into a documentary about nuclear threat totally cold, the reality is they might come out and be a little bit unsettled. And I don't have tools that I've also given them to work through the feeling of being unsettled versus we create what's called an onboarding experience where we really make sure people feel comfortable with the, the technology and they're familiar with the topic. Even if they don't know anything about nuclear weapons or poverty or gun injury, we at least make sure they know this is what they're about to put on their face and experience. Even if it's not sensationalized, even if it's not explicit, it can still be very unsettling or it can put people off their center. And then we show them the experience and then we have them do what we like to call aftercare, which is basically our process in helping them decompress and helping them integrate back into the experience they saw. And um, Brian, I feel like there was pieces of this with nobody's listening. I'm sure you've also had to do pieces where it's just the headset and you have at least, like you said, a survivor there or yourself there or one of your colleagues there to make sure you're giving context to the piece. But there is sort of the facilitation process that has to happen. And that's, to me, again, that idea of mobilization. You're not just sending out content. You're really mobilizing people to go. You're mobilizing headsets to go. You're mobilizing really an experience. So tell us, and, and, and in that way, when you talk about mobilization or I talk about mobilization, I also think it's called an impact campaign, right? Because you're campaigning. It's like a way of bringing things to people. So Ryan, tell me a little bit about how you mobilized or distributed or however you want to describe um, Nobody's Listening at two different audience members and to different types of people. Thanks so much. So, I mean, there's there's been two ways of looking at that. One is the work that we're doing in Iraq uh, where we received um, funding from the US government and the UN to take this to 120 people in five different cities across Iraq as part of a research assessment uh, that was carried out by an Iraqi uh, team um, called the Digital Cultural Heritage Research Center and led by Professor Mohammed um, um, Rosan Mohammed Amin. And it's been really wonderful, again, just to have that group of people and that funding to, to, to do it in that way and see the impact. And I think that's the first time these tools have ever been used in Iraq for these types of purposes. So that's been really wonderful. It's been a lot more of a struggle to get funding outside. Uh, we were delighted to get funding for the full art exhibition uh, that um, was um, received uh, very graciously from the state of Baden-Wittenberg in Germany. This was um, a part of Germany that took in uh, Yazidi um, women refugees and rehabilitated them. So they loved what we were doing with the art project because a lot of the paintings were of some of these survivors or by some of these survivors. So that was like the full exhibition that we launched. Um, but we also want to create a kind of more mobile exhibition, whether it's some of the artwork or just the VR headset, where we can go to conferences to show it to um, decision makers or take it to schools. Um, but it's still very much a struggle, I have to say, you know, um, it's basically, you know, using our human rights contacts and Yazda using their contacts in governments that we've been able to kind of organize meetings with ministers or get into ministerial conferences. But it's been like a struggle to try and kind of penetrate the VR world, so to speak. Um, you know, we always send the file via we transfer to different people, you know, on the creative side. And it's always funny to see um, how many people actually download the file, which is sadly not that many. 
And so we, you know, th this is the reality of what we live in. You know, this is a very specific topic about human rights that most people won't care about. So it's literally, we'll need to always go and put the headset on people and create that kind of surrounding to enable them to do it. Um, so that's a struggle that we face. And, you know, decision makers are always very busy and ministers, the last thing they want to be doing is a 12 minute virtual reality. You know, you've got to make that massive sell. Um, but what I found has been the most important is just word of mouth. Showing it to one person, who will tell another person, who will tell another person, and eventually we get to the right people. Um, and then the other side of the project, um, you know, which is where it's morphed from being a purely advocacy uh, human rights campaign about delivering justice and recognition for, for the Yazidi community, is now morphing into something where it's a more educational tool, uh, where we are setting up a schools program in the UK, where we'll have a school, um, you know, a, a lesson plan to talk about the VR, to talk about genocide, fighting extremism. Uh, we're also launching a tour of US universities with the full exhibition next January as well. So I see that being the kind of future where we can use this in, in, in the education sector. Um, and also not just talking about the Yazidis, but how do we talk about human rights more broadly and using these tools which I think, again, I mean, I'm, I'm new to this world, but it's always amazing how few people have done VR, whether they're the decision makers or even school children and others. Um, I mean, of course, there's a lot of people doing games and otherwise, but when you want to have these kind of more hard hitting issues, um, you know, we showed this in a university in the UK um, for a course in modern slavery. And it's a common kind of, you know, um, um, a response. A number of students saying, oh, I learned more doing this than any of my textbooks. And so, you know, I think this is where this will be absolutely key in the future. Uh, once Brian, I feel like hummer, you, uh, you know, opened up my playbook of mobilization and ripped out all of my pages, um, which is great. I'm so excited to hear there's other projects doing this because that's exactly the work that I'm doing right now with Games for Change and their XR for Change vertical, which is um, we're working on university tours. We're working on what we call wraparound materials with education. So wraparound materials, whether it's for policymakers, we adjust it for policymakers. If it's for the public, we adjust it for the public. And then the biggest wraparound material we're currently working on is education-focused wraparound material with high school students and university students. And really what we're trying to do is make a playbook, which I've told you about right now, for so that people like you who are human rights activists, so that people like Oni who have worked with artists, like you could basically pick up a playbook and say, how do I mobilize my experience? Here's Here's some best practices. Here are the best people to, to talk to or here are the best people to reach out to because you're right. This is such a brand new sort of a, a newer space. And like I've sat for hours troubleshooting, you know, Quest 2 headsets to be like, why isn't this working? Oh, I need to make sure the Wi-Fi is off or, oh my gosh, I can't log into multiple accounts on this headset. Oh, I need to make sure that the account is set up on a developer mode, right? Like all these weird little practices that no one talks about when you try to mobilize technology on a wider scale or, oh, how do I restart the headset with somebody inside of it if they're having issues? Because I can't see what they see. Is there a way I can do it remotely without toggling with their face and pushing buttons when it's on, right? Like all these little awkward things I'm sure we've all kind of experienced through this. Um, and really putting together a playbook of best practices of saying, here's how much funding you need to do it. Here's where we recommend looking for that funding. It's exactly what you're saying. You know, with the nuclear threat project, we worked with people who are working against nuclear weapons, right? We worked with ICANN and Plowshares and N Square because those are the people that are interested in funding these creative artistic endeavors, right? And I think that is part of mobilization, just as much as it is to get funding for your creativity, you also have to get funding for your mobilization. And that's, I think, right now a broken model because most creators out there are just funding creativity. And once it's done, they're like, oh, I have this cool piece. And you're like, what are you going to do with it besides putting it in a film festival? Right. And that's that's a big conversation we need to have, um, which is great. So I'm so inspired and so excited to hear all of that. And I'm excited to hear how the pieces going to continue to be mobilized into next year with the university tour and 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 i'm sorry that you know you like you said you've been having a difficult time with the vr industry um i would be happy to connect with you and 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 see if there's ways you know we can we can help you all and make introductions for the project and